afternoon everybody and welcome back again to those of you who have been before and welcome to everybody who's new. Lovely to see so many people from so many different places. So today we are looking at a one hour introduction to DBT and we have a speaker, Dr William Davis, Head of Applied Clinical Psychology at the APT and myself, Amy George, who's Deputy Director here at the APT. So it's lovely to see so many people in chat from all over the world, which is fabulous. So the speaker is Dr. William Davis. He is a consultant psychologist and head of applied clinical psychology at the APT. Post qualification courses written by him have been studied by over 125,000 mental health professionals, meaning that his input has influenced interventions with literally millions of people. So it's all yours, well. Lovely. Thank you very much. It's nice to see people from Leicester, isn't it? You know, see Leicester uh, nicely represented. It is. That's um, where we are. And there's a few from the Midlands, actually. Lovely to see so many people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. I'm just trying to share my screen. Uh, da, 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 there we are. Um, there we are. There we yeah. are. Yeah. Nice. Well, thanks. Thanks, Sames, for that nice introduction. It's lovely. Um, now, hello, everybody. The, i tell you what I've done is to go on the web and see what people ask about DBT. And they ask a lot of things. And I've written down all the kind of things they, they ask. And I thought I'd try and answer those questions. And you might say, well, we could go on the web and see what the answers are ourselves. But I'm trying to do sort of proper, proper answers, if you like, because there's some really good answers on the web. But at the same time, there are some uh, not quite such good ones. So let's have a look what uh, what we've got. The title is uh, What is DBT? And I thought it might be interesting, uh, while I, I'm about to say what DBT is, in uh, my opinion, but I wonder if you could uh, just write down in chat, if you were going to say one thing about DBT, one thing you feel you definitely know about DBT, what would it be? If you can just have a think and just write it down in, in chat, that'd be splendid. You can, um, if you're shy, you can just share it with uh, panelists, uh, me and Amy. But ideally, share it with everybody, and everyone can get a can get an idea of what people think DBT is, whether it's uh, whether it's generally thought to be or not. I'm guessing we're going to have a mixture of people in our. Uh, we've got several hundred people, and I'm guessing it's going to be a mixture of us. Some people, I bet, are really interested in DBT, know all about it, and just want to tune in and see what's being said about it. And other people, I guess, really don't know anything about it, and that's why they're here. So have a go, if you can, put just, just put one thing, uh, one thing rather than too much. Anything some brilliant in? things coming in. Right. Uh, we've got it ranging from, I've no idea, to right. skills-based approach for emotional regulation, um, behaviour therapy of some sort for personality disorders, two versions of the truth, just all sorts of good things in the chat box. Fantastic. Okay. Well, wow, that's uh, that's very good. It's going around all, all the way around it. That's super. All those things are pretty much elements of it. So let's have a look. It is indeed was originally designed for borderline personality disorder, a very severe form of personality disorder, uh, originally termed borderline because it was thought to be on the verge of psychosis, borderline with psychosis, very severe. It does, inv does involve teaching people skills, yes. The basis of DBT is to teach people life skills that they don't have at the moment. Key life skills that are really good if you happen to have borderline personality disorder. Third thing was, it was founded in 1993 by Marsha Linehan, who wrote two books. One was The Cognitive Behavioral Treatment of Borderline Personality Disorder, which is a huge book. It's jolly good for keeping doors open and so on. It's just a great big tome, and it uh, takes uh, takes a lifetime to read it, but it is it is absolutely fantastic. It is a, a masterwork. And she also wrote though the skills training manual for treating borderline personality disorder. And what that is is a book full of handouts. You can photocopy if you own it, and you can hand and photocopy the handouts and give them to the give them to patients. And they are great. They're a bit complicated again, but they are great. We have a look at some alternative handouts later on. The other thing people might have said is that it's applied to other areas now, which we will look at is other than borderline personality disorder, but certainly started off with BPD. 
Okay, so that is, in a nutshell, what DBT is. One of the questions people ask is, what is DBT used to treat? Well, we know one answer to that is borderline personality disorder. But if you have a look what uh, NICE say, they say BPD, they also say self-harm, which is often a component of BPD. And they also say binge eating disorder. At first sight, surprisingly, I think, but of course, binge eating can actually be described as a form of self-harm in as much as it doesn't do people much good. And it's often used to alleviate distress and so forth, just as self-harm is. But you might say, that's what NICE says, just those three bullet points. I've added something. It says, you might also say, obviously, that it's used to treat or could be used or should be used to treat anybody whose problem is because they lack specific life skills. The crux of DBT is to teach people skills they are lacking. So if your patient's problems are because they are lacking particular skills, then obviously, if we teach them those skills, we're going to do them a, a great favor, a great service. Now, another one that crops up is, what are the four modules of DBT? I promise you, that's what it says. What are the four modules? That's what, uh, if you Google it, that's one of the questions that people ask. And actually, the, the, the term is modes, normally. The four modes of DBT are these. We said it hinges on teaching people key life skills. And the first mode, therefore, is skills development groups. Groups where we teach people key life skills. Some people get confused. They say, oh, skills development, where professionals develop their skills. No, 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 no. It's where we, we run groups to help patients develop their skills, life skills. Second module is one-to-one -one therapy. And the, the purpose of that is to help the people, help the people who've learned their skills, generalize their skills to their real life. It's no use learning skills in the classroom, as it were, on the other end of Zoom or whatever. It's to help the person apply their skills to real life. And that's the main purpose of one-to-one -one therapy. It's also to, you know, solve, solve any problems that crop up, sort, sort out any problems that crop up, to support the patient in whatever way, and uh, generally to provide that uh, support and problem solving. The third mode in DBT is telephone consultation, which is where the patient can phone you up. If you're the therapist, they can phone you up and say, I'm in a terrible fix. What am I going to do? Uh, and you say, well, what about the skill you learned in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the group session? Could you apply that now? Which one? Well, the one about uh, you know, mindfulness or interpersonal effectiveness or whatever it would be. You say, well, how, well how, how would I do that? And you can, it's literally in crisis. So the conversation can go very much like that. And you help them to apply what they've already learned in the, um, uh, in the real life situation. And then there's a fourth mode, which has you know, nothing directly to do with the patient. It's the consultation team meeting where everybody, all the professionals involved in DBT get together. So if you've got uh, you know, um, half a dozen people maybe running skills development groups with patients and uh, two or three uh, individual therapists, they all get together and they support each other and they discuss how things are going and they check they're keeping in line with what you're meant to do in DBT and so on. Right. Next one, uh, I, I kind of enjoyed this exercise, just taking things from uh, what people search for. What are DBT techniques? Which is a, so another interesting question. I thought, well, hmm, good question. I uh, wonder what we'd say to that if somebody asked that. And my answer would be this. The first, the first and crux technique is teaching people the important life skills they need. That is, whichever way we do it, whether it's in groups or one-to-one, -one, there's no rule that says you must not do it one-to-one. -one. If people are lacking important life skills, then uh, we do them a service. If we can teach them those life skills, either in groups or one-to-one. -one. So that surely has to be the number one technique, I would say. Second thing is to help people apply those skills. And to do that, the kind of techniques we use are relentless problem solving. 
because you don't want other problems to get in the way of applying these skills. So, and this is the way Linehan phrases it. She says, relentless problem solving. We are actually kind of welcoming problems and looking for them and solving them. Validation, which I hope we'll have time to look at. The use of metaphors, because people respond so well to metaphors. If you're into solution-focused therapy, you will know that metaphors are fantastic. And telephone support we just mentioned to support people when they're trying to apply things in their real life. So if, if I had to answer the question, what are the DBT techniques? That would be my answer. It's not a question you kind of often ask, strangely enough, but that is, uh, that is about it, I think. Another one, if you look up what is DBT, is what is borderline personality disorder? Well, that's a fascinating question, I think. And um, if you really want to know, if you want to see it firsthand, watch Breakfast at Tiffany's. It's a wonderful film. It's, I don't know, it's made, goodness knows how long ago. There we are, put it in italics. That's the name of the film. Audrey Hepburn was the star, and it kind of, well, I don't know, maybe Roman Holiday really made her name, but it consolidated her name. Uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, just amazing. And I've seen lots of people with borderline personality disorder. I've never, ever seen such a good um, sort of embodiment on film. Of, of, of a person with BPD. Um, Film's getting a nice lot of love on chat. Oh, right. <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, well, perhaps we should have then, in that case, we perhaps have two points, two point question. Uh, what is the opening theme tune to Breakfast at Tiffany's? Um, but while we're thinking. And while people are thinking about that, could you say which character in the film has BPD? Oh, it's Audrey Hepburn, the star. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Le Leanna and Anne-Marie have got two points with Moon River. Oh, very good. Well, you knew and then you knew them. And um, Yana is remembering her throwing the cat against the wall. I know, I know. Uh, and Sam and Rosalind, sorry, you get two points too. If it's any consolation, the cat does actually appear in the credits, so it does get, you know, some kind of recognition. Um, yeah. So um, the second thing you might say about BPD is it's a very serious disorder um, and it was made known by Marsha Linehan. She tells the story, she's a very good speaker, by the way, if you go on the web and look for uh, talks by Marsha Linehan, there's about 10 million of them and she does speak very well. She's very charismatic and she's very open and straightforward about, uh, about everything really. But it was made known by her and um, because Prior to that, she didn't invent it, but prior to that, it was pretty much uh, the, confined to uh, people who were into psychodynamic psychotherapy. They were into that, but it didn't appear in DSM. Uh, I can't remember which, uh, which version it was of DSM at the time, but it didn't appear in DSM. And nowadays it does. I remember going to a talk about borderline personality disorder in the 1980s. And I knew nothing about it. And I was very ashamed, but neither did anybody else, it turned out, except for the speaker who knew everything about it. But it was made known in 1993 by uh, Marshall Linehan. So it's in DSM now, and it's also in um, the uh, ICD-10 uh, as emotionally unstable personality disorder. The kind of symptoms, you know how many symptoms these things list, but the kind of symptoms, the key symptoms are pulled out Intense and unstable relationships. Uh, unstable is the key thing, intense and unstable. An unstable self-image. Impulsive and often dangerous behaviors. Spending sprees, unsafe sex, substance misuse, reckless driving, binge eating, you name it. Self-harming self behaviors such as cutting and recurring thoughts of suicidal behavior. So it tends to be the self-harm and, and the suicide that uh, gets it um, up the importance level. The unstable relationships, I mean, I've, I've, I know I've mentioned uh, this person before, but it's one of, the, uh, one of my favorite patients, to be honest, who uh, had, was, had very um, clear BPD. And she was in a happy marriage. And she, uh, she, said, to, she said to her husband, uh, uh, do you love me all, all the time? And he says, uh, no, he thought he was joking. He said, uh, no, no, I find you uh, really annoying sometimes. 
And uh, she said, well, in that case, we're going to get divorced. And, and typically with BPD, although that was a kind of a quick reaction like that, she then carried it through. She had the stability to carry it through. Even though she loved him and he loved her and so on, they got divorced and they remained divorced. So it's just really um, unhelpful to the person, you know, and that's, that's I think, a part of, the, part of the pattern, that all, all the things they do tend to be very unhelpful to themselves. Right, a BPD, <clears throat> fascinating uh, condition. Molly has asked, um, is she right in thinking that EUPD is linked with attachment issues and can be viewed as complex trauma? Uh, yes, is the short answer. It, it is. And, uh, that, and same with BPD. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, uh, rightly or wrongly, the, the diagnosis of BPD is attached to women more than men, just as the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder is attached to men much more than women. The reverse applies in uh, BPD. And just sorry again, but if anybody wants anyone else to see their um, comments, they will have to pop them in all panellists and attendees rather than just all panellists. We're getting a lovely lot of comments to Will and I, which is lovely. But the um, chat group is a lovely place for everyone to reply to as well. It's that little arrow by the little arrow by where you type the thing in, isn't it? Just above where you, where you type in, it should say it should give you an option for all panellists and attendees. Yeah, just click that arrow. Okay. And, um, uh, why do you think it is that um, women have more um, BPD than men? Oh, well, that's a good question because I carefully phrased it that the diagnosis is, atta is attached to women more than it is to men. And, uh, but I, I do suspect that's actually uh, accurate. And the, the long and the short of it is I have no idea. I really don't know. Um, it's interesting that Linehan proposes, you know, uh, kind of inherited or at least biological factors. It's not all psychological, there's biological factors going on. So whether whether there's hormones involved or some kind of thing uh, along those kind of lines, I have no idea. And to be honest, I don't know there is a real, um, I don't think anybody has much idea either. In due course, perhaps we will. And you've sorted out a lot of people's TV viewing tonight with breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, you won't be disappointed. I wish I was seeing it for the first time. It's marvellous. Mind you, to see it for the hundredth time is good as well. Um, okay. What does it mean to think dialectically? Some smashing questions come up on the web. Um, equally, uh, Ames, if there's better ones on the uh, in the chat, I'm sure that's uh, that's a good idea too. No, the they're way, nicely uh, pouring in actually. So, no, lots of um, questions when you're ready. Great. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a bit of a break for a minute. <clears throat> I don't like your threatening tone. Okay, the word dialectical. Uh, now, a dialectic, a dialectic, um, is to resolve differences between two, two views and reach an agreed to truth. It's a very appealing notion, really. It contrasts with a debate and where you have adversarial and so on. Is to try and reach agreement between two opposing views. So in, uh, in therapy, the dialectic, the most, the most often used dialectic that we will use in DBT is to either say or imply to the patient that their emotions and their behavior are valid, meaning understandable, and your emotions and behavior are not working well for you, or your emotions and behavior, you would do well to change them. And you see on the face of it to say, you do well to change your emotions and your behavior. And also to say that your emotions and behavior are understandable. They seem to contradict each other, don't they? But not at all. It's uh, exactly, exactly the case. If you talk to many patients with uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, traumatic upbringings, basically, you can see that their emotions and their behavior are completely understandable and valid. And yet they're not working well for the person. So they would also do well to change their emotions and their behavior. And this is something that Marshall Linehan is very, very good at and very strong on. She says, if you, if you talk to people with, with borderline personality disorder, they are, if you say to them, look, you really ought to change your emotions and your behavior, they get angry and they say, well, uh, do you not understand why I behave like this? Uh, so that's no good. 
On the other hand, if you if you accept their behavior and their emotions, if you go along the acceptance route, they say, don't you realize how it works so badly for me? It hurts me so much. So you have to apply the sort of dialectic thinking like that. There's other dialectics of, as well, of course. Do I list any here? No. But there's things like, um, uh, for example, uh, the patient can think, well, the, the therapist cares about me a lot. And the therapist keeps making me do things I really don't want to do. Both of those can be true and probably are true. You know, if you're going to make progress, you probably have to do things that you've never done before and can be difficult. And uh, that's, what, that's what a therapist would do if they care about the person. Um, uh, children can think, uh, my, my parents love me and my parents won't let me do everything I want to do. Those are, and they seem to be in opposition, but they're not really, are they? <clears throat> what heading are we under? What does it mean to think dialectically? Oh, yes. Another example of thinking dialectically, I, I'd say, is the wise mind, and which is possibly the best known single concept from DBT. Now, the wise mind is the overlap between the reasonable mind and the emotional mind. Uh, the reasonable mind is all from the cerebral cortex, very logical, very rational, very right. And the emotional mind doesn't really want to be um, yeah, rational or right. It's very emotional. That uh, clue is in the title. And the wise mind is the overlap. And that is, it's a really, it's a really great concept, I think, and really does uh, represent an overlap in uh, uh, neural activity. It kind of produces what I think of as the Goldilocks zone. It's not too logical, not too emotional, just right. And it really works well for people. And it's interesting, the um, research people have done on people who are lucky, Con people who are consistently lucky, and people who are consistently unlucky. And of course, when, if you're consistently lucky, it's obviously not really luck. But consistently lucky people are people who do the kind of thing we're talking about this, using wise mind decisions, rather than too logical or too emotional. Just in case it's distracting anyone from carrying on, could you say what DBT stands for? Yeah, Dialectical Behaviour Therapy. Super. And another thing that might be distracting people, um, in case you're worried about getting a copy of the slides, we don't slam the slides out, but you can listen to a recording online. Um, it's normally um, popped up on the website by the end of the week. So no need to take notes, it will all be available online. Yeah. Yeah. Good question, actually. What does it stand for? Because uh, Marshall Lennon is very clear that this is behavior therapy. And um, uh, anyone who can knows anything about behavior therapy will be pleased and delighted about that because uh, it's got such a research behind it as uh, behavior therapy. Um, now, this is a fascinating question, too. The crops are, how is DBT different from CBT? Well, it's only one letter different but it is actually completely different. And it's a bit like saying, well, how is a car different from a ship? Uh, they're both methods of transport, but they are completely different. And DBT and CBT are both, both methods of helping people and used by therapists, but they are actually quite different. So <clears throat> I've done some preparation. So I've got some uh, slides here, only two. I've got two slides on CBT. The original notion in CBT was three factors interact with each other. You see, normally people come along to therapy complaining about their emotions, that they're sad or distressed or anxious, whatever it is. And short of saying, well, don't feel like that, uh, you can't really act directly on people's emotions. So the insight that emotions you know, stem or interact with thoughts and behavior was a very good insight. Perhaps if you led a different life, behaved differently, were involved in different behaviors, perhaps your emotions would be differently. Perhaps if you thought differently, your emotions would be different. And that's so in CBT, then we were looking at people's thoughts and altering people's thoughts and altering their behavior with the aim normally of altering people's emotions. If you work in the forensic field, though, it was different. Very often you're trying to change people's behavior. So you might wish to change people's emotions in order to change their behavior. So you might wish to, uh, for example, make people more empathic to other people in the hope of changing their offending behavior and so forth. But basically the interaction is there and that was the key insight. 
And to be fair, in the UK particularly, <clears throat> a lot of people just plug that the, those three things still, which I think is uh, not the most helpful thing, to be honest, because um, in APT and in the United States in particular, uh, we recognize two other factors, and they are biology and the surroundings. So if you look at this hot cross bun type thing here, you've got the original things there. You've got biology, emotions, and thinking. They're still there. But there's a fourth one come in in purple, biology. All set against the background of the surroundings, and especially the social surroundings, the people around the patient. But everything around the patient, to be honest, what they listen to on the radio and watch on television, um, uh, what, what their place looks like, and so on, all, all manner of things environment especially social surroundings and that was actually um we 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 introduced it way back when but it was really made uh, made much better known by christine Podesky. she uh, and she coined the phrase the hot cross bun which i just used a minute ago but that's her phrase and it's used very widely and that's you can see why it's called the hot cross bun can't you so the five factors there behavior biology emotions and thinking set against the social surroundings and surroundings in general. So that's CBT, very nice. So you can talk about any of those factors in a one-to-one -one session in, uh, in therapy and so on. And that, uh, it's really good therapy, it's excellent. <clears throat> but it's quite different from DBT. Whereas the crux of DBT is to teach people the skills they're lacking and to help them to apply those skills in their real lives. So slightly long answer to what's why they're different, but they are quite different. Sylvia's <clears throat> asked a question mm -hmm. that I've often wondered is that how can we be wise? I think that's going back to the wise mind, um, but is there a way that we can sort of be in our wise minds? Um, yeah, the traditional way of doing it is to take it one step at a time. What is the logical way, uh, what is the logical answer to this? Uh, <clears throat> second way is say, well, uh, what do I fancy doing? What, what have we got an urge to do? What's my impulse to do? And then you say, well, is there any kind of overlap between the two? Now, I, the example I often use is a friend of mine who was trying to choose between a, a BMW and a Ford uh, for the car they wanted. And they, they adopted the wise mind uh, uh, approach. And they looked at everything fuel economy, uh, resale values, uh, even I, the thing that sticks in my mind was how much leg room there was in the back of the car for their children. And it got everything, it got all the data. And uh, to cut a long story short, the, the better car was the Ford. And I said, well, so which, which did you buy then? He said, the BMW. I said, well, why did you do that? He said, I just fancied the BMW. So he went with the, yeah, the uh, emotional mind, if you like. And, you know, fair enough. And that, but that is, that, that was really a wise mind decision because he'd got the, he'd got the um, data and he'd got his impulses and he, he converged the two. And you have to end up buying one car or the other. Well, he could have bought a, a, a Vauxhall or whatever, but, uh, but he, you have to ultimately buy one or the other. And that is a very good analogy for life sometimes. You have to, you know, uh, stay or go as it were sometimes. Super. <clears throat> All right. Good, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next one. What is a DBT service? Just before <clears throat> we move on, Rudy did may have a similar experience with his Alfa Romeo. You'll be glad to know that he never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, who, anybody who buys an Alfa Romeo is a real car aficionado. <clears throat> good, for, good for them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay, what is what is a DBT service? Well, this is where you might have you know eight, ten, twelve professionals involved, and they some of those people will be running will be doing uh, seeing, see, will be running groups to teach patients the skills they need in those groups, and uh, that's uh, that's fantastic. That's almost like the starting point. But others will be seeing the individual patient one-to-one. -one. 
the patient people from the groups will be seen one to one and uh, you know, by their therapist. Every patient will be supported by phone. They'll be able to phone up and say, I'm in dire straits, help me. And all the professionals, whether they're running groups or whether they're seeing patients one to one, they will meet in consultation meetings, normally referred to as the consult in DBT. So DBT service has those four elements, the three bullet points plus the heading of the slide. Uh, key skills are taught in groups, then one-to-one -one sessions, phone support, and a consultation meeting. Consultation meetings for professionals, not for patients. That is a DBT service. Some people do that. Some people have very good DBT services, and some people do it individually, <clears throat> which we'll look at. Can I, do, can I do DBT on my own? People ask. Answer is yes. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, people might say, well, it's not DBT then. Well, yes, it is, I'd say, because the key components of DBT is you have to teach them skills they are lacking. Skills we're going to look at, skills they are lacking, life skills. And you can do that one-to-one -one if you wish. You have to support them in applying those life skills in their everyday life. You can do that on your own. You uh, have to allow phone support to you. Well, you can choose to do that. A lot of employers don't like you doing that, so you have to watch out for that one. Um, ah, now what about the last one? Can you go to a consultation meeting? Well, maybe, maybe not. You may know a lot of other people who are also doing DBT on their own. Or you might say, well, I have supervision which achieves the same function as a consultation meeting. So yeah, you can teach people skills and you can support them using those skills and uh, away you go. And to be fair, I say yes, because a lot of people do that. Um, are you going to come to, I'm not sure if you'll come to this later, but can you name some of the life skills? Yeah, the life skills, yes, I can. It's, uh, we're, we're, coming on, we're coming on to it. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, just while we're on it, though, the key one is mindfulness. Second one is interpersonal effectiveness. Third one is emotion regulation, and the fourth one is distress tolerance. If you're working with adolescents in particular, you also look at uh, walking the middle path. So, just we'll we'll come on to that, but just uh, while we're, while you're asked, it's nice to have the answer. Super. Is DBT good for anxiety? Smashing question, because uh, Linhan actually says no. And uh, But of course, the you might say, well, <clears throat> if the anxiety is caused by a lack of key life skills, then it would be good for anxiety, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, if you're able to teach, if, if you're able to teach your patient those skills. The only thing is that in DBT, the skills you teach are limited to the ones I just listed. And those are the only ones in the workbook. But you might say, well, it's kind of DBT. If you teach the anxious person the skills they are lacking, then that's sort of DBT, isn't it? But the straightforward to kind of correct answer is no, not really. <clears throat> but I think DBT is great. And uh, mindfulness is great as well. And DBT has mindfulness in it. What are the target behaviours in DBT? Well, there's no general target behaviours in DBT. The target behaviours are the behaviours you want to target for that patient. So, for example, if, a, if, a if the patient is self-harming and cutting themselves, for instance, that would be the target behaviour. If they are you know, harming themselves and also drinking too much, then those two would be the target behaviours. Whatever it is with that particular patient, those are the target behaviors. There's no general target behaviors in DBT, although you, know, you might say that the ones that crop up frequently in borderline personality disorder are things to do with um, uh, reckless behaviors of various sorts. <clears throat> okay, I think it's time for a tricky question. Oh dear. If you're setting up a new DBT service, what yep. would you say is the golden rule? What would I say is the golden rule? <clears throat> yeah. Have consultation meetings. <clears throat> nice. And, and I'll tell you why. It's like a higher order factor. 
because if you have one of the functions of consultation meetings is to for everyone to check that everybody else that everyone is doing dbt correctly so it's a self-check mechanism also uh, in dbt you are typically working with uh, patients who are difficult and it, it, if you're not careful you get burnt out so a consultation meeting supports all everyone involved so whatever else you do have a consultation meeting and it's a good question because you can actually start your consultation meetings even before you start your dbt service Brilliant. Super. I hope that helps, Martin. You're getting some good questions coming in, Ames. Blimey. There's a lot of good questions. I'm trying to spread them out. So don't worry if I've not got to yours. I'll be coming back. <laughs> right. What was that? What are the target behaviors? Uh, what happens in DBT skills development groups? Um, uh, the skills that are taught are, like I just said, mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, distress tolerance, and walking the middle path. Emotion regulation skills, what that means is the skills needed to regulate your emotions. We said that in, in a borderline personality disorder, uh, people fail to regulate their emotions. They find it very, very difficult to do that. And that's partly a biological thing, which you know is unfortunate, but it's partly learning the skill to regulate your emotion. And that's what emotion regulation skills are about. Distress tolerance skills, the skills to tolerate distress. A lot of people will um, uh, think of suicide or attempt suicide or self-harm as a means of coping with distress or getting away from distress. So it's very important to learn the skills of tolerating distress. And uh, yeah, and mindfulness is just wonderful anyway. So um, yeah. Those are the skills, and this is the agenda. If you if you already run groups, this might be the way you run them, uh, and is a is a sequence, just a seven step sequence, which is in, in extremely kind of logical. You first of all welcome people. You have to say something. You say, you know, welcome. How how how's it been? How's the week been? You got here okay? The bus came all right, or whatever it is. Number two is once people are together. Uh, a mindfulness session because um, it's the research on mindfulness is rock solid and it's one of the core skills in DBT so we start off with a mindfulness session then you have a homework review the previous session will have had homework attached to it so it's very important to review how, how that homework went then typically time has gone on by now so have a break the whole thing is meant to be agreeable and so if it's a live session, you can have a break. Uh, at the moment, we are teaching a lot of um, uh, doing, doing, this, doing these sessions via Zoom. And it also works via Zoom. So you don't typically have much of a break on Zoom. So because there's no milling around and chatting. Number five is the new teaching. So you might now be talking about some distress tolerance skill, for instance, whatever it is, a particular skill for today. There's new work, new new homework to set or agree, where the person goes away to practice that skill, and then check out. In other words, you know, be friendly and nice when you say goodbye to them. <clears throat> that is the standard sequence, and that's what you do every week, every time. Just going to run through the skills in a little bit more detail. Mindfulness, um, we uh, know. And to me, and I think I'm not on my own, the power of mindfulness is in deflecting the second arrow because in PTSD or depression or anxiety or borderline personality disorder, it's the second arrow that's more distressing than the first, meaning that you're depressed and then you get distressed that you are depressed get irritated and agitated and angry that you're depressed again and that is the second arrow so you're now not only depressed but you're also irritated and angry and agitated about it and the two together put you down in a spiral which is a million times worse than your original depression so that's the power of mindfulness that you can learn to accept that you are depressed or have anxiety or have borderline personality disorder symptoms or whatever it is 
and simply leave it at that without spiraling downwards. I think it might be time for another tricky question. Right. <laughs> work with people in a validating way without building dependency. Um, Kath here has um, had issues before, even though boundaries are in place with the patient building up what they see as dependency and then sabotaging recovery when due for discharge. Yeah. Well, one thing is that um, it, it, it is a real issue, I think, this. I mean, there's a lot of patients who don't want to be dependent, so the question doesn't arise. But there are patients who do become dependent, and uh, the question does arise with them. The, the biggest single thing you can do, I think, is not to make seeing you, the therapist, uh, dependent on being ill. So it's a, it's a lot to sell to your manager that you can see people who are well, but you can see what's going to happen if the patient has to be ill to see you and they've got dependent on you, then what are they going to do? They're going to be ill. They, they, they're just not going to get better. So you have to you have to alter the contingency so that they can see you uh, even though they are even though they don't kind of need to. And I have to tell you, it's very nice for the patient there, but you don't it, it doesn't increase your workload massively, and it is very nice to hear from people that you that that are, that are doing well. So it's not entirely bad news that it's quite a quite a good thing. That's the single best thing you can do, I, I think. Brilliant. And would you, in your DBT groups, would you involve parents and carers? If you're working with adolescents, for sure, yes, yes. Um, yeah, if you're working, if I was your patient, then you probably wouldn't involve my parents. But if, if you're very young people, yes, you typically involve the, um, uh, the parents and carers. Because that's wonderful, because um, you're teaching the patients, namely the adolescents, to apply new skills. And they've got a lot of skills to learn during adolescence. There's lots of new skills to be learned at that point. And, um, and in a sense, you've got a, almost like a, a proxy therapist in the form of uh, the parent to help them with those skills. And very often, um, the, the, the therapist teaching the skills to the adolescent will invite the parents in as well. So everybody learns the skills. And um, what are the main differences between delivering DBT therapy with adults and adolescents? Uh, well, that's the that's the difference that people cite. The, the fact that you have other people in the room very often. You know, you're working with adolescents, you are um, uh, you might have their parents in the room as well. That's the biggest kind of most obvious difference. I think there's a secondary difference where with adolescents they are entering new um, you know, new arenas all the time, and the, the the skills that are required come thick and fast. And it's no, it's no uh, mystery that so many adolescents self-harm. And it's normally in an attempt to uh, deal with distress of uh, various sorts, you know. And if you can teach them better means of dealing with distress, then it uh, negates the need for self-harm. So, yeah, it was just more, more work to do with adolescents than with adults. Super. Second one is interpersonal effectiveness, um, which let's just have a... Great thing in a DBT, in the book of handouts and so on that I mentioned, is there's lots of acronyms to help people to help you remember the most relevant things. One of the acronyms uh, under interpersonal effectiveness is GIVE. And it's this, be gentle. No attacks or threats, no judging, no sneering. Be interested. Actively listen to the other person. Take an interest in their point of view. Validate, show that you get their viewpoint with your words and with your actions. And have an easy manner, smile, be diplomatic, use humor if appropriate. I can see, you can see this, can't you, that if you're working with an adolescent, that might be a terrific amount of work to do to, to try and convey those kind of ideas, depending on the person you're working with. There's plenty of adolescents have, just seems to come natural to them, those kind of things. But equally, there's lots of people who, those kind of concepts are almost alien, if you know what I mean. So, but there's, uh, there's lots of skills like that, lots of uh, information sheets like that to help learn the new skills. Under emotion regulation, um, I just pull out one. Uh, it's have values and principles. 
if you want to regulate your emotions to have them kind of controllable if you like and predictable how can you what can you do have values and principles for example these are not uh, cast in stone but the examples be part of your family or a family develop your ability to enjoy things and to relax make sure you learn new things that's very settling and grounding take responsibility for things likewise take care of relationships and learn how to do it and be true to yourself have integrity honesty and loyalty so these are you know, extremely solid sort of learning that goes on distress tolerance an example of learning from about distress tolerance the tip acronym tipp change your body temperature using cold water or ice um, there's a lot of stuff now about wild swimming which is typically very cold swimming and it's alleged to really help people to uh, to you know, tolerate to tolerate distress and regulate emotions really yeah. intense exercise walk quickly run upstairs jump up and down run on the spot paced breathing into five out to seven and paired muscle relaxation tensing your muscles and breathing in relaxing when breathing out um, just one more question uh, Stephen had a group of seven patients with LD and they all dropped out because it was too demanding is there any advice on using DBT with LD patients uh, oh. uh, to be honest I haven't got a only I've only got I've only ever worked with LD for about five years so I haven't got a lot of uh, experience there but what I would say is it doesn't matter whether you're working with LD or anybody else. It, the, the sessions have to be not only manageable, but they have to kind of be a bit rewarding. You have to be a little bit of fun as well. Um, and learning skills can be a bit of fun, especially if it's in a group and it's uh, you know, you're doing uh, role plays and so on. It can be, can be fun. But spot on, but well admitted, it, is, uh, it can be hard work and people can drop out. I think there are a few people working with LD in the chat box if anyone's got any ideas for Stephen too. Uh, walking, we're, we're walking the middle path and this is the skill of understanding that two opposing things can be true. For example, <clears throat> this is just an example of walking the middle path. There's other examples as well. Life is difficult and it's also rewarding. That's quite, a, that's quite a, an eye-opener to uh, people. Linehan talks about um, uh, building a life worth living. Other people talk about building a life worth the suffering because you know, life always involves suffering. It just, it just does. You, can, you don't ever speak to anyone who reaches a certain age without having suffered in some way or another. So building a life that's worth the suffering. My parents don't let me do whatever I want and they care for me. My therapist keeps pushing me to do things I find difficult and also wants me to do well. So those are the kind of skills that uh, we, we look at. Okay, we're going to go. How are we doing, Ames? Are we running out of time? Or? I know, it's 10 to, ten, 10 to 3. It's a shot along. Okay. It's a pouring in, but I'm trying not to bombard you too much. Okay, well, let's. I'll try and sort of... Zoom, I mean, I'll try and zoom <laughs> through... <laughs> What do you do in one-to-one -one sessions? Well, I think we've said it. Individual sessions are to problem solve, to maintain the client's motivation to change, to help the patient apply the skills they learn to real life. And by the way, the fourth thing is we always have a consultation meeting. So there's telephone support we've mentioned earlier on. There's um, the consult we've talked about where you might have four to eight people. Normally someone chairs it. And the purpose is to keep the level of adherence to DBT principles, to recognize stresses and strains on the therapists and resolve those, and to discuss problematic cases with the purpose of trying to get solutions to the problems. Um, uh, uh, yep, uh, uh, validating, yes. Oh, well, let's have a little exercise on validating. Perhaps uh, towards the end. Have a look at this, everybody. I'll read it out with you. 
And the purpose of validating is to, to make things seem understandable, okay? So that your, your reaction is you convince the patient uh, rightly, so not, not a bad convincing, you show the patient how what they did was understandable. Let's have a look at this one. Laura is 17 years old. Life is full of ups and downs. Suicidal feelings since she was 10. Impulsive, doing things she later regrets, thinks in extremes and had problems with relationships. Last time you saw her, she was looking forward to the first date with a, with a friend of a friend at the cinema on Saturday evening. It's now 10 a.m. Sunday and you text her to ask her how it went, which is entirely uh, okay and right in DBT, that kind of contact. Her reply is as follows. Rubbish. He turned up really late. We missed the start of the film. And so I told him not to bother. I felt great for a minute, but I ended up home alone on Saturday night, drinking and feeling sorry for myself. It was a really stupid thing to do. Okay, so your reply is to validate what she's just said. What, um, which of these, Amy and I are gonna to have to work out, which is gonna be a show of hands, isn't it? Just while we're working it out, uh, you decide, if you would, please, which is the most validating uh, response. Something that gently points out that it's sometimes best to bite your tongue, otherwise you suffer more in the long run. Something that acknowledges how great that minute can be after you've just told him not to bother. Or three, something that asserts the boys are not worth bothering with anyway. So, now, when we say hands up, it doesn't literally mean putting in because we can't actually see you. So it's no use oh, putting your hand up. No, we're getting some lovely we're getting some lovely numbers coming in the chat box. Ah, well, which they're pouring but we, in. But we need to know which one they're voting for. Yeah, we're voting for number two. Oh really? Oh, I see. Oh, okay. You say. I'm with. Otherwise, it. everyone just keeps their hands up. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. There's Is an overwhelming surge of number two. The sprinklings of ones. Well, clearly. Clearly, the, um, the 383 people here are overwhelmingly validating then. They're a very validating group. Actually, well done, because it's, it's strangely difficult to um, get across the concept of validation sometimes. So very well done, everybody. Um, because number one is tempting, you see, isn't it? It's, it's true. But uh, number two is the most validating. And we do have the occasional two, then one, just to spice it up a bit. If you <laughs> yes. Well, oh, well, good point, actually, because validating the person is not the end of the story because the patient normally says, oh, well, it might be understandable what I did, but it wasn't a very good idea, was it? And uh, you say, well, what else, what else could we have done then, you know? And on you go from there. Uh, one other thing you do, well, one, one of the other things you do very often in one-to-one -one sessions is chaining, key concept in DBT. You look at the chain of events that led up to something we'd prefer hand of happened, like self-harm or attempted suicide. We then examine where the chain can be broken if the same sequence of events happens again. Very big thing in, in uh, DBT. Very sort of straightforward, co common sense, very good. All right, problem solving, metaphors we use. Um, uh, yeah. Let me just say a word. If, uh, so I've, I've zoomed through to the end, Ames, if that's all right. Um, because I know. There's a lot to cover, isn't it? My head's very full. Oh, well, yes. I must be looking quite shifty because the time is over there. See, I keep going to the time. But um, in summary, DBT is about teaching people the life skills they need and then supporting them in using those skills in, um, in their real life. That about, in one sentence, that's as close as you can get to what DBT is. All the rest is we've been expanding. If you want to take it further, well, obviously the best thing to do is to attend uh, one of our courses, DBT Essentials. It's funny, actually, because Amy and I are adamant we must not advertise anything. On the other hand, it seems very stupid not to actually tell you what's what's about. So if you did want to attend a course, that would be the one to go on if you're interested in DBT. But if you are already a skilled therapist and also skilled in running groups, what you might do would be to buy Linehan's 
Skills Training Manual for Treating Borderline Personality Disorder. Brilliant handouts in it. Or possibly even better handouts, Jill Rathus and Alec Miller's The DBT, DBT Skills Manual for Adolescents. Now, it says for adolescents, but if you read the handouts, they're darn good handouts. It doesn't matter whether it's adolescents or adults. You can go on sites such as DBT Self Help, but I think really it's worth, you know, at the very least, buying, uh, buying one of these books. And uh, uh, the DBT course there is a very popular course, I have to say. Right. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> Well, Sue has very kindly told us that we should advertise so that we can um, succeed and carry on doing this, which is very lovely of you, Sue, but we, we'll carry on, don't you worry. Uh, so, but um, if, if a bit more information about if we're going to carry on. But we did also just want to say that it is completely free of charge as response to our uh, as our response to COVID and its variants. So really thank you for attending. We love seeing you all this every week and feel free to invite others to future events. Um, we are sadly not sure how many free sessions we'll be hosting. It depends on a couple of things, how long COVID lasts and how much interest there is. But I think this one's been the best attended so far with nearly 400 people on it. Um, so um, we, well, we love doing them. So it's all good. And a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you by the end of the week. And so if it's not come by the end of the week, um, check your um, junk box because Mark does those and he is very efficient. <laughs> Have you got anything else to say, Mark? Well, I'm just thinking of next week, actually. Um, next week, we're looking at biological factors and leading a, leading a nice, rewarding, enjoyable life, biological factors involved. The concept next week, actually, is to try and record something that the mental health professionals who watch this might, uh, might so as it were, refer on to their patients. So, you know, it would be good if people do ask questions like they normally do. And we're trying to record something they they might want to might want their patients to see basically oh, lovely so mm -hmm. a joint enterprise yeah yeah a little bit like that super so that's fabulous so i hope to see you all next week lovely Bye. Thanks. thanks